Welcome to the Business Trendsetter Podcast, where we talk about trends and how to grow a business. My name is Manny Taran. And I'm Adam Hartung. We are Spark Partners here every week to deliver ways that you can use to grow your business. Uh, it's a different way of thinking. And one of the things we talk a lot about, uh, in addition to trends, it's kind of a cousin of trends, and that's the idea of scenario planning. Now, I live here in Tucson, Arizona, and uh, we live in the desert, and we're affected by lots of things. We've got some water issues. We've got property values that are sort of skyrocketing. And a lot of this is because, uh, and I'm not blaming anybody in particular, but there's a lot of things happening in California that affect what's happening in Arizona, uh, beginning with the water stuff, but also just people that are transplants that are coming in and buying property and increasing the value. And so it got us thinking here today about the conversation regarding scenario planning and how somebody could see or could have foreseen some of these things that are happening today in, in say, for instance, Tucson, uh, five, 10 years ago, and, and could have been really laying the, the groundwork, the framework in order to capture lots and lots of business by just reading the trends. We're not reading tea leaves here. We're reading trends. So, Adam, say, for instance, 10 years ago, what should I have been looking at here in Tucson with res respect to uh, California coming in and the water issues and so forth and so on? Well, uh, water is, is an obvious one, and, and I'm going to tie that to climate change. Um, you can't be a climate change denier. I guess you could deny the source of climate change, but it would be a very odd duck if you tried to say the climate wasn't warming because it, it absolutely is warming. And we knew that 10 years ago. So uh, that was about the time I was preparing to leave Illinois, for example, for a variety of reasons. And one of the things I would tell people as I was leaving Illinois was that, in fact, if you had a real long term view, you know, being in upper upper half of Illinois and Wisconsin was in 50 years going to be a great place to be because climate change was going to have a dramatic impact where it was going to shift to some of the nicest weather in the country up there. It would be, uh, it would be much nicer in the summer, and there will be places that will be inhabitable, like Texas, who's likely going to become far less, um, far more inhabitable, not a nice place to be. And so as I looked at Arizona, you know, we recently interviewed the fellow that has the winery there south of Tucson, and we asked about, well, what are your expectations about the weather? What are the implications? And, and this is obviously becoming a big issue because uh, Lake Mead is now down to 27% uh, of its capacity. They found six bodies in Lake Mead this summer, which were divulged simply because the water receded to the point the body was there. I've been fascinated. They're finding bodies where people drowned 20 years ago, and they're finding the bodies and they're able to identify them now. <laughs> so, um, crazy. And, you know, they're talking about within a year, possibly within two, without some dramatic changes, that um, Lake Mead could become a dead pool, meaning that there's no fresh water flowing into it. And therefore, there would be no fresh water to flow out of it. And, you know, this this is a big issue, right? It's a big issue for all of the southern states. So it's uh, you know, Nevada, it's Arizona, and it's Southern California. And you need to, and I see people not paying any attention to this at all. You know, when I moved to Arizona, I thought, okay, this is the biggest, biggest risk that I'll face uh, in moving to Nevada. I'm sorry, in moving to Nevada would be that what would happen if there was a shortage of water? Then I found out some interesting things about how water is priced, which is that there's nobody that is a national water czar. So local uh, localities get to set the water prices and that Arizona set its price lower than anybody else, which encouraged consumption and therefore agriculture in Arizona. And now, of course, there's a big fight and a big debate and we're looking at changing the prices. And when I look at this, I say, OK, 10 years ago, you could see this coming. Were you preparing for it? That doesn't mean you can't have a business in Phoenix. It doesn't mean you can't have a business in Tucson or any other town, Kingman, Arizona, or Flagstaff, or any other town in Arizona. But it would be foolish to assume that, that you perhaps wanted to have an agricultural business if it used much water, because the price of water is undoubtedly going to go up. There's going to be lawsuits between California and Arizona. Who's going to get the water? How much are they going to get? Nevada will right. be in the middle of that. Uh, Utah is going to be in that fight. Um, and the mountain states are going to be in it because they're pushing the water's coming off the, the west, the, the, uh, the, the bank, you know, the western bank of the Rockies. And, and that's going to continue to just dominate the future. Now, the thing that I think people don't understand is we talk about this like, OK, OK, they shake their head up and down. And I say, all right, have you incorporated that into your future scenario? Have you started thinking about what this might mean for your business? 
You know, it, it, have you, because I mean, I'll, I'll go back again. I think Phoenix and Tucson are great towns. I, I, I prefer the smaller Tucson area to the greater Phoenix area. But 50 years ago, Manny, when you were born and when I was a young man, um, you didn't expect temperatures in Phoenix to cross 110 for 25 or 30 days out of the year. It was hot. Yeah. But you're not in this sort of 110, 115 persistently hot weather. Well, now it is. So is that is that sustainable? You know, can you have a megalopolis like Phoenix that has, what, what, what do they have, 10 million, 12 million people in Phoenix? No, now? I'm not quite there, but they're, they're definitely, <clears throat> they have the lion's share of the population in the state for sure. I mean, it's millions of people. And it's attracting. Five million, five people. or six. Yeah, it's attracting people by the tens of thousands, right, to Phoenix. And, and is that sustainable? You know, will, will it be a place where you can have manufacturing, where uh, you you know, where you can run a business and have people live and work and enjoy life? If we're going to reach a point in the next decade where you're looking at 35, 40, 50 days over 110 every year, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not saying people are going to leave, but I am saying that I would certainly put that into my projections, right? I would start to think about that, and I would build it into the scenarios. People tend to take say, well, here's my scenario of the future. And then they'll say, well, should I think about water? What I say was, well, just start, first of all, thinking about the trend in terms of water. And then get your mind around what that, how big that trend is, and then right. apply it to your scenario, right? What's going to happen? How might that happen? What's going to occur? Let me give you another example. There are a lot of people fleeing California now. And uh, some of the places are going to include Texas and include uh, Florida, all right? Well, we now know that if we stopped raising the temperature of the planet, stopped, we've got to stop tomorrow, right? Magic wand, stop. We now know that the ice in Greenland will continue to melt for another 30 years. So much has melted already that with this additional amount of melt that's going to happen, we're looking at in the next 10 years seeing a rise in the oceans. It's a predictable thing. And we're seeing that the ocean, the, the, Ice melting and the ocean rising is happening faster now than was predicted a decade ago. So the models are all getting updated. And that means anything on the coastline is going to be affected. It's not just, you know, is your house right there on the coastline where, a, 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 you know, six inch raise in the water, how does that impair your house? But also it means that the tides will be bigger, the incoming tides. It also means that because the water is warmer, hurricanes are going to be more prevalent. It also means that when they have storms, the rain is going to be more prevalent. So, you know, if you're moving to Miami today and you're assuming the weather in 10 years will be like the weather today, you're wrong. There's going to be severe flooding as far inland as Hialeah because it won't be able to control the tides coming in and the amount of water coming in. Texas, there's been a rash lately of businesses on like Elon Musk, um, the guy who runs Oracle, moved his headquarters, the Oracle headquarters to Texas. We're here seeing this sort of a movement of a lot of um, tech companies that are moving their headquarters and some of their operations to Austin and parts of Texas. But then look what Texas was like last year. They had, to, you know, two years ago, they had that giant ice storm that came freeze, through, yeah. kind of shut the state down. Then this summer, they were going through this extreme drought. And it was super, super hot. And then immediately after that, they got hit with floods. They just devastated Fort Worth, devastated Dallas, and then moved east across the state into Louisiana and Mississippi with additional devastating flooding. Now, that was all predictable. It's all very predictable. And for 10 years, people have been saying this is what's going to happen. Why? Because the warming climate means that you're going to get these droughts. And then what's going to happen is the warmer water in the Pacific Ocean, because we have that southwest to northeast flow of the air across our, our country, it will bring the water up into the air. Um, and the monsoon rains that you're used to getting in Arizona will be more, yep. but also it will push them to the east. And you're going to get these um, belts of rainfall that are going to go through Texas that are going to drop 10, 12 inches of rain at a time. And so you're going to have massive flooding. Now, 10 years ago when I was reading about this, 12 years ago when I was reading about this and I was talking about it, I would say that the vast majority of people I talked to thought I was crazy. They said, you can't predict the weather 10 years in advance. Well, yes, you can. I mean, it is possible to model these things. And another thing I was attacked with was, you know, people saying, well, you're just a Texas basher. And I would say, I don't know that you're being a Texas basher. I'm not telling anyone not to move to Texas. But I am saying that are you prepared for this? Yeah. Are you planning for this? Well, this it goes back to that idea of scenario planning, right? I mean, you've got to look yeah. at – I think it takes a, a – uh, you've got to get out of your own way sometimes. You know? You've got to think about really this is a painful conversation you need to have with yourself regarding, okay, this is not 
today is not going to be the same. You know, uh, the world in 10 years will not be the same as it is today. And making those hard decisions for your business and for your, um, you know, what you're doing. Like, for instance, in Phoenix is uh, very quickly becoming the semiconductor focus of the, of the U.S., yeah. So there, uh, there's a big Intel plant there. They built another one there. There is a, a, a couple of giant uh, Taiwan semiconductor company is moving in there. And, and all of those uh, use massive amounts of water. And so you've got to be, if you're in the water business or if you're in the utility business, you got to look at how can you be part of that. Um, you know, I think I mentioned to you before, Adam, that I am now uh, running a company that has some some tools that are actually in the the semiconductor space, and I think being here in Tucson is going to give us some uh, an advantage. Um, and so certainly as a business, you know, how can you be prepared for these things? And I, I guess how can you really – what decisions can you make today that will be of benefit to you uh, as the future comes? Yeah, so one of the things – water. let's say, for example, go back to water. What a resident a residence pays for water – per cubic foot of water is not the same amount that a business like a like a like uh, an office building pays for cubic foot of water. And it's not the same as what a manufacturing company pays per cubic foot of water. And it's not the same as what a process manufacturing company pays per cubic foot of water, which is not the same as what an agricultural, a farmer pays per cubic foot of water. That the history of America has been that they have we had these pricing adjustments. It's initially to, to encourage agriculture. You go back 120 years ago, and we were an agrarian country. And so they wanted to make sure that the agriculture got the water first, and then we kind of built after that towards it. Well, what's going to happen now is I think you, you got to be realistic and say, okay, what's likely to happen? Okay, there's a country, we're doing defense-oriented projects to get our chips going. Remember the CHIPS Act that got passed by the federal government? It is clear that more money is going to go to Phoenix great place to live, money, more jobs, that kind of thing. You would anticipate that what they'll do is they'll make sure there's plenty of water for chip manufacturing, and that'll come first. So they'll get the lowest price for the water. Now they'll start saying, well, how much water is being consumed? Now how does it get divvied up after that, right? If you're if you're doing something that you're making parts for chip plants or you're you know, feeding them into that, you probably get a nice rate for your water. If you're a resident, so probably we tend to try to take care of people residentially. You know, we'd like to be able to make sure that they got plenty to drink, take a shower, and flush toilets. So they try to take care of that too. But if you're doing something like food processing, you know, making ketchup or you know some kind of food processing, you're liable to get pushed aside. You're liable to see your rate go up, 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 up. You know, and and uh, and be more and more difficult. And so, are you planning for that now? Is what I would say. Are you thinking about that? Are you thinking it through? Um, are you prepared for that kind of a, a of an impact on your pricing? Um, and then, you know, just thinking about housing. Are you thinking about how uh, housing? So, you know, most Phoenix, like most cities, start off as a small city. Uh, single family homes dominate in small cities. But what we know is that as temperatures rise, you're better off to have dwellings that are multifamily dwellings because you have fewer external walls. Um, you can have different uh, locations in terms of how the building's yeah. located, so you have better shading. You can do things to moderate the heat, right. right? If you go look at these ancient cities in the Middle East, you don't see people living in a bunch of single family homes all scattered around with, right. with sand in between them, right? You, the reason is that they, they learned hundreds of years ago, how to build in hot areas to reduce the heat and to bring cooling from the earth back up out with, you know, wind tunnels and things like that they put in place. Well, you need to anticipate going down that road. You might be a great Phoenix might become, you know, a town of multifamily homes that are, you know, more, uh, look more like someplace like, you know, the Middle East, like Dubai or, or a country like, uh, you know, in that part of the world, Saudi Arabia. So, the thing is to think about that, because if I was going to put a chip plant down there, I'd be thinking, how am I, if I want to bring a 1, thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand people to Phoenix, well, then how am I going to house them? And am I just going to leave yeah. that up to the politicians? Am I going to leave that up to the homeowners to figure that out? Or should I, as a business person, get into the middle of that and think about it? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and it also says if you have opportunities, if you can think of ways to conserve water, where you can say, hey, here's a process that uses 10 percent of the water of a current process, that's a great business opportunity now. I mean, there's money in the new Inflation Act to try to um, bring those products to market so there can be you know, greener manufacturing, greener processes. You should, If you've got any ideas for how to save water, how to reclaim water, yeah. how to reuse water, <laughs> this is the time to be right yeah, on top of those. We've talked about those two companies, Dynamic uh, Water, 
that has a technology that enables um, these uh, these big plants, these uh, uh, HVAC plants that use chillers and cooling towers to uh, recapitalize and reuse that, that water yeah. over and over again by using um, kind of an electrolysis uh, technique rather than chemicals. You know, that's going to be huge. We've also talked about uh, rain blocks. It has a uh, sort of a Lego system for being able to uh, capture rainwater and, and then hide those uh, those tanks behind uh, basically what becomes a wall or a um, part of a, of a shed. And I know there's tons of other, other technologies out there that are going to get a lot of attention and really have that ability to expand. But it, a lot of it, I think, Adam, has to do with um, – sort of sh uh, short-term suffering for uh, <laughs> massive future gains. Yes, we do. Uh, you know, I, I, all my life I heard, you know, quarter to quarter earnings and, and take care of the short term, long term takes care of itself. Yeah. And we're waking up, you know, been waking up for 25 years to realize you can't run a business that way. That, you, you know, it's not just quarter to quarter earnings. And CEOs would they'd say, well, why, CEO, why did you make that decision two years ago that's now got your business in so much trouble? Well, because I had to have rising uh, earnings per share quarter to quarter. And that, and that really wasn't true. It was an excuse. It was an excuse to make the easy decisions, you know, to just say, well, I want to focus on one metric earnings, not think about the long-term viability of business. Now we don't have a DuPont anymore, for example. DuPont got blown up because, you know, I thought too much short-term and not enough long-term. We have a lot of big corporations that we've lost because they didn't think about these longer-term issues. Um, and that's one of the things I'd say about, you know, definitely some of these companies that are eyeballing going to a place like Texas. Uh, or, I mean, I could put in that, you know, parts of New Mexico. I could add onto that the southern half of, California, of Oklahoma, for sure, um, and Louisiana. There's those That whole area, you've got to be really thoughtful um, there was, there's a billboard now in, in San Jose, California. So for our listeners who aren't familiar, that's sort of the one of the centers of the tech world, right? San Jose. There's yeah. a billboard up there now, and it says uh, the tech something along the lines of the Texas dream has is not is not for real. And it's got a got a picture of a guy with a hoodie with an AK-47, and it's got the word Uvalde on it. And it's very clear what they're trying to say is if yeah. you're living in Texas and you think, it, I mean, in San Jose, and you think the minute tech communities are too expensive and the housing is too expensive, then are you sure you want to go to Texas where all where guns are far more prevalent? And that, there's just no doubt guns are far more prevalent in Texas. Uh, just go read the daily reports about Beto O'Rourke and his campaign for governor and kind of what he deals with. And he goes to his daily um, campaign meetings. Um, you know, they have no state income tax in Texas. That's true. But they have some of the highest property taxes in the country. If you've taken that into account. And then the whole weather thing, right? You know, like, do you, are you comfortable? Are you going to enjoy the really hot summers? Are you going to enjoy the massive rainfalls, the flooding and the things that go along with it? And so it's a matter that, when you, if you've got a business, you got to think about what your business needs and what your employees need. And you got to think about, am I going to be able to attract people? And a lot of people get attracted for short-term reasons. There was an article I read recently in the Washington Post where they were interviewing some people that had moved to Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. Then they said they moved there for work. And the first, they were, the first encouragement, that two things came to their mind. One, lower cost of housing. And number two was no income tax. And then they got down there. Well, pricing of housing went way up during the pandemic, so it came on par with a lot of major cities. That then also got them to a very, very high property tax rate, much more than they expected. And they said, yeah, I can get a $7 burrito here, which I couldn't at my home, but I'm eating it sitting outside where it's 112, and I can't hardly stand it, right? So I'm not comfortable, I'm not enjoying it very much. And there was the whole Washington Post article was about people that had moved down there and how a lot of them found it to be a very, very difficult adjustment. And uh, some of them were um, certainly not sure they were going to stay, right? So um, you, I think people have to think about these longer-term issues like water, you know, like we're talking about here, climate, like we're talking about here, because those are going to have significant impacts. Um, you know, another one, we've got just a little bit of time left here that I think I'd like to talk about is um, some of the things that are going on in the media. Um, you know, we are part of the media change, Maddie. Um, yeah, we are. 25 years ago, these podcasts were not doable. It, the technology didn't exist. If you wanted somebody to know who you were, you wrote a book, you got on television, you know, you did things like that to try to get to where you were known. You, you often get on the cover of magazine. I did all those things. I was on the cover of Computer World. Um, I wrote magazine articles, got, got quoted in them, um, did some television interviews along the way. Um, and I wrote a book, of course, which was published by the Financial Times Press. But it's interesting because those tools are definitely obsolete now. 
you can't because part of that and I was all driven by this notion of editors and people that looked at material. So, oh, write a book. Why? Well, because we didn't have Amazon. You couldn't right. self publish a book. And so that meant somebody who was a publisher had to think your idea was good. Then you had to write it. Some editor had to think that you wrote it in a good way. It never it didn't make it to market unless it got through these hur hurdles. Well, today, those hurdles don't exist. Anybody can publish a book. Literally, anybody can publish a book. So then. Now, then what happened was the magazines. Okay, we relied on trade rags, as we called them, right? And everybody, right. if you were in the tech, if you had the computers, you had these all these computer magazines. You, you, if you were in the making roadways or construction magazines, these things slapped down on your desk somewhere between once a week and once a month, uh, every two weeks, whatever. And you looked at you know who's big in the trade, who's who's selling, well, what contracts are out there. All this came to your desk. You read it, you looked it over. Those are gone. Trade rags are just gone, right? Uh, I was writing for CIO Magazine, Chief Information Officer Magazine, right up to the day that they canceled the magazine. <laughs> they had me writing their leadership column. And, you know, it was kind of like just n nobody's reading the magazine. Yeah. Right? And so now, so what happened was we had this thought about how you got information out to your customers, how you got information out to the world about your success. And it was getting, like, publishing this information, getting the publishers to publish it. But I was reading today about how Gannett now owns 40% of the daily newspapers in the United States. And because they're losing money at such a rate, they're going to they already have started a process of laying more people off. And in towns that are, are smaller, there might only be one journalist left working for Gannett in that town. They're literally letting that one person go. So there's no longer any journalist for what was... Probably once a daily yeah. newspaper that now maybe is a like weekly newspaper. My yeah, I mean, my hometown. Newspaper. Yeah, my hometown, of course, was, uh, you know, the Daily Dispatch was uh, was around for since the 20s of last century, 100 years. And and my uh, niece uh, worked there, I would say, about seven, eight years ago. They had a staff. They had a handful of reporters. They had an editor and they had a photographer. She was a photographer. And last I heard is they had the, the one guy that uh, that is still there, and then there's no daily publications anymore. It's once a week. Yeah, it's all changed. So fourteen, roughly thirteen years ago, I was in Chicago and I was invited to meet with a bunch of journalism students at Northwestern University. Northwestern, excellent, excellent school and had an excellent, excellent journalism program. And uh, it just happened, people I knew, and this was a group, of, they would get together, they wanted business leaders to come in and talk with these journalism, graduating journalism students about the world. And I came in and I said, look, I'm not going to be nice. I want to be honest with you guys. You're going to have a tough time. I said, the future of journalism means that we have the Sun-Times in Chicago, we have the Tribune in Chicago. They both will not survive. One will die. The one that remains will get much smaller. At the time, they'd already had financial collapse, and I said they're just going to go bankrupt, bankrupt, bankrupt till they're gone. And these graduating you know, college students were not very pleased with the message I was delivering, but I said, you're going to have to be a freelancer. You're going to have to find your own stories. You're going to have to find ways to publish them. You're going to have to go out, find the story, dig it up, and be yeah. able to contact some kind of publisher to get it moving, to get paid for it, right? Well, now we've moved to the point you can't even freelance your way as a journalist. There's there's no money. You could go find some great article about what's happening in, in southeastern uh, Arizona. But, as, you know, if you go to the Douglas newspaper, they don't have any money to give you. even if you've got, you know, an expose on somebody that's polluting the local creeks, there's no money to pay those people anymore. So what we as business people have to do is back up. So saying, wait a minute, how do we get our message out? How do we talk to people about our innovations? How do we talk to people about our ability to save them money? Uh, how, how do we get that uh, message out there? And you, again, there's no trade rags anymore. Uh, you can't, you're not going to get on television to do this. Uh, another factoid, last quarter, we reached the point where when it came to the television set, I mean, the, old, the television set, right? I'm not talking about a computer. I'm talking about a device you would call a TV in your house. 38% of the usage was done with streaming. And 35% was watching television. In other words, using cable channels, the thousand right. cable channels, broadcast channels. We now have in our homes, we're using them to stream uh, things to watch rather than watching television. Yeah. And then the, the balance was other uses like video gaming and other uses you would have for time on that television. 
So what it's saying is that you, 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 those channels are no longer able to t- get your message out there. And you can't go to the local newspaper. You can't even, you know, in the old days, you could support the local politician. You could say, hey, Joe, you've been great. I'll give you a few bucks. Let's be friendly. You know, I've got something for the town. Let me come and let's go have a, you know, we'll get together and we'll get the press to come by and we'll get a little TV, get a little radio, get a little newspaper talking about new jobs and things we're going to do. There's nobody there to cover it anymore. No, it's so, all changed. Media is increasingly becoming at the end of your arm, right? Your hand. What can you do for yourself? How do you make it happen? And as much as people hate to say it, it's Instagram. It's Facebook. It's Twitter. It's social media. You have to be out there telling your story all the time. You have to try to get that message out. Mm-hmm. And, and in fact, it looks like we may even be TikToking because it, you know, every time I look at the numbers, the demographics of people using TikToks are getting older. Older and it's older. A different, it's a different format. Uh, one I'm not personally comfortable with right now. But the reality is, if that's where your customers are, if that's yep. where the eyeballs are, you got to go get to them. Yeah, so we had a. Are, is your scenario, are you planning for that in terms of communicating your, the things you're doing as a business? to your current and your new customers. Exactly, and you know, last time we we interviewed uh, Dr. Ram Gayoso, who runs uh, Futures Television and also is the editor-in-chief of an online magazine called the uh, International Market and Competitive Intelligence Magazine. And he's launching this new uh, radio initiative. It's really an online radio of anything. You know, and there's a company here in Tucson called AZ Luminaria that is kind of a, a new way, a new uh, online news source. So it's all changing, right? And, you know, I've, there's so much information this day and age that you've got to be able to be able to sift through it and make your own decisions, right? You've got the left, you've got the right, you've got this whole political um, sphere that's fighting for the same vote. And it's really polarizing the news. And, of course, the, uh, the masses, we're at the, at the crosshairs at the end of the day. Somebody asked me very recently, you know, what I did for a living. And, you know, for years I would tell people I was a strategist. And I always thought it was kind of funny because nobody knows what a strategist does. And I don't know, I, I guess it's the charm is worn off. I don't find it as funny anymore. But I've started telling people what I do is I help people plan for the future. I do scenario plans. And you go back, Manny, before the pandemic hit, the things we were talking to people about, you know, how to be more mobile with your business, how to uh, work uh, asynchronously with people, how to use the gig economy. We were talking about these kinds of trends way back then. We said, put these into your plan. Figure out how to incorporate them. Well, when the pandemic hit, what happened? All those trends became even more important, yep. right? But as the, as the pandemic was coming along, what we started talking about, we're talking about um, demographic shifts. So there's not a lot of young people out there anymore. We're talking about um, environmental impacts and how that's make, affecting decision making. And now, so we started saying, look, you got to be aware of this stuff. Are you preparing for it? That was three years ago during the pandemic. You know, you and I are starting to get to that stuff. And now today, what, what last week, California passed a legislature passed a law that after 2030, you can't sell an internal combustion, new internal combustion car in the state of California. So, like, if you were thinking about that three years ago. and you What were year is that, by the way? Sorry? What year is the cutoff? 30. 2030. Yeah. Seven and a half years. You can't sell a brand new internal combustion car in the state of California. And forever, ever since California has been a state and there's been state regulations, California has led the way in terms of how we deal with our automobiles. If you look at our safety requirements for our cars, they were originally set in California. Um, distance, the average distance, you know, should you be able, how far do you want to, how big is a gas tank? What do you want? Cola, uh, not, I'm not sorry, not cola, uh, the um, um, average miles per gallon uh, standards, all yeah. those were originally set in California. And now California's laid this new bar down. That's going to accelerate, right? And so, the what I'm trying to get to is we've been talking about those things for three years, four years. They're happening now, right? And so we're talking about where the waters, what the water issues are going to be, mm-hmm. again, where the demographics are going to be, impact on policy, immigration, those kinds of things. And I think people, a lot of people aren't incorporating that into their scenario planning, and that's no. unfortunate. They really should. Now, and I think there's a couple of things they can do about it. You know, one, again, we keep saying this over and again. If you're stuck, we got a $90 course, I think it is, the course about how to get unstuck, right? How to deal with your lock-ins. If you don't have a scenario plan, shame on you. Shame on you because yeah. you're going to get caught like somebody in Miami standing in, in ankle-deep water in your business because you didn't plan for it, right? So we got a course. The master class takes you through how to take a look at that. 
And if you're just stuck and you're standing in a spot and you're saying, I need to be pushed, then call us for crime and sakes. We can yeah. take a look at any business and start saying, hey, are you thinking about this? Are you thinking about that? Is this factor affecting you? How are you trying to make a decision? Yeah. It, gonna, go ahead. It's crazy how, uh, you know, if we're going to build a house, we we talk with an architect, we got to get permits or we have to, you know, kind of go and, and do a lot of due diligence that if we're going to write up a contract to a hire a new employee, whatever. We spent all this time and effort and money on getting a lawyer, but very few people, very few companies actually spend any time uh, and, and dollars and resources building out a true scenario plan for their business. It's just, I sort of shake my head. I go into businesses all the time and I see that they're not, they're living paycheck to paycheck on uh, on the business side. Uh, and I mean, it doesn't say, I mean, I'm not talking about the ARAP uh, revolution. I'm talking about where are they going to be in, in, in just five years, in two years, in one year. It's a lot of uh, blind faith. In 2013, I was living in Chicago and um, I got to really thinking about, hey, I'm going to stay in Chicago for the rest of my career because things had changed. I could tell that with all the tools that were coming along, I didn't have to be in Chicago for my clients anymore to take advantage of technology. And I could, we could go, my business could be much more mobile. And so I started saying, where do I want to go? And I picked Nevada. And when I said I was picking Nevada, every time I tell somebody, they said, oh, you're going there because they don't have an income tax. And I would tell them, you know, that was the last thing I learned. What really drove my decision was the fact that Illinois was losing people. Chicago was losing people. Real estate prices were depressed. They weren't recovering. You can't have a good real estate market if you don't have people coming into the state needing housing. Um, the restrictions on manufacturing were great, so manufacturing wasn't doing well. Uh, the state was bankrupted because of, a, of a, a pension plan had been created that was not a sustainable pension plan. They were out paying out too much money, and the corruption was causing problems. I said, these were the issues driving me out of Illinois. And when I selected a place to go, I did it based upon how many people, what was the growth rate, I wanted to know what the age was of the people. Like in Florida, yeah, they're adding a lot of people, but they're retirees. Nevada was adding a lot of people who were younger people coming there for jobs. They're yeah. expanding the economy beyond casinos and gaming into a lot of other industries. You know, Tesla had just built a plant in Reno for the, the new battery plant that they put in Reno. Those were the issues that drove me to, to Nevada. They said, this is going to be an, 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 an environment that's going to be a growth-oriented environment. And I was worried about water, right? So... And that's what we're trying to say to people is get your get your thought process down for mm -hmm. how to make these decisions and make the decisions. Don't let short term things like, oh, that's a cheap tax, <laughs> low tax state or uh, that's got a better uh, the environment this week or you know better climate this week. Think yeah. about these trends and how they're going to impact you, your life, your business long term. You have to have scenario. You have to plan for the future, not from the past. Get those scenario plans done. Absolutely. Sorry, one, of, one of my favorite Adam Hartung quotes is uh, is basically to to get outside the box and then think. That's right. Because oftentimes That's right. we're in that box and we still have the same mindset. We still have the same framework and we're making decisions based on where we are today. But you got to move that box. You got to move out of that box to the next level. Right. You've got to be like that hermit crab that lets go of its house to go and get a bigger one. Um, and so, yeah, get out of that box, then think. Yeah. I mean, trends are not stoppable. You cannot stop the trend. Where is it going? Figure that out first and then build your business around it. Excellent. Very well said, Adam. Well, thank you for your time. We'll be talking to you next week and uh, learning more about how, how we can grow our businesses. Great. And everybody have a happy Labor Day. Cheers.